have done entire podcasts that I didn't record in it and, I, and I'll uh, never forget again. Yeah. Once you make one big mistake, it's kind of like um, nowadays I, I save like randomly every five minutes. It's just like a part of my. Yeah. Even if things auto save, I yeah. still just ha am in the habit now of every single yeah. thing I do. Yep. <laughs> All right, I think we're good. Um, I apologize if you hear banging or if you hear my cat in the background. I've got two little kids running around, so, but it should be good in the studio. Cool, yeah. Um, likewise, I've got, I've only got two cats, but one of them really enjoys um, video chats, so she might make an appearance. <laughs> hey, that'd be awesome. Maybe they'll meet at the same time and they'll talk to each other. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> this is what the people want. Cat podcasts. What do the yeah. cats have to say? If I want to go viral, that's I won't even <laughs> label it anything about comics or nothing. It'll just be <laughs> when two cats fall in love by fate. Uh, um, yeah, if in it's not like my show is has a, a super wide reach, so it's I, I don't expect you I don't expect you to have watched any of my episodes. But um it all, all I really do is, especially if I, for someone when they're fir their first time on, is I, I basically just let you talk. I try to just, I'll give a brief rundown of how I know you, how I know of you, why I wanted to talk to you. And then I just sort of say, fill me in on your career. And then we just sort of vent back and forth for about an hour. Great. Um, and so I actually found out about you because I was at a comic convention, I want to say last year in St. Louis. It was the one that was in Collinsville, Illinois. I can't remember what that one was called, but I was yeah. there and the person next to me was an advocate for the St. Louis Writers Guild. Oh, yeah. And they were sort of just filling me out because I didn't hadn't heard of it at that time and uh, and she was just like, yeah, you should, you know, look at these classes that they have, maybe even, uh, see if you can lecture at one of them yeah. and, uh, see other people that are on board. I'm always so busy. I never get a chance to actually go to their events, yeah. but, uh, through that, I ended up learning about you and I, and I was like, whoa, this person is, does everything at a mainstream level. And yeah. teaches locally uh, yep. and is really active in the community of all different aspects. So from my understanding, you create art, write, do edit editing, teach at Webster University. You are a, a, some form of uh, higher up at the Slice, which I'm not exactly sure what that is. Uh, yeah, I'm board president. And, um, and, but your big claim to fame, I suppose, is you are worldwide with a comic strip that's in the main newspapers throughout the nation, if not the world, for the comic that takes place in Philadelphia, if I right. read correctly, uh, called yep. Heart of the City. Yep. Um, so if you could, just fill me in on... Oh, and the reason I... Obviously, of course, for my audience, they know that I am in the St. Louis area... But you are a, a, a I guess a, a local legend in the comic space of St. Louis, and really all as a whole in the comic scene. And you are in very much. I feel like what's more of the growing market, because a lot of people that reach out to me are not trying to get right for Marvel and DC. Yeah. They're trying to write graphic novels, manga strips, alternative slice of life kind of stuff. That's right. And, that, and you seem to be, that is your wheelhouse. So if it you is, could fill yeah. me in. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so where are you located? Where in, in the area? Oh, I'm in uh, St. Charles County, right in the middle of oh, St. Okay. Peters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, well, uh, I guess just to start from the beginning. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, um, you know, I went to school for studio art, um, as many people who go to school college from high school they may not exactly know what their full-time career is going to be you know they just kind of go in and hope for the best and that's really what what I did as well um so when I started with my uh studio art degree you know I didn't really know if I wanted to do like if I wanted to do painting I, I didn't really know I just knew that I really liked art and I didn't know like what 
kind of uh, careers were out there for me. And as I went through the, um, the program, um, I like switched to graphic design, decided I hated graphic design, went I, back I to student same. art. <laughs> it's not fun for me. No. <laughs> and um, and but, yet you know, we now do it all the time. <laughs> you know, I think it is good, though, that I did switch into it so that I knew for sure that I didn't want to do it, you know, so I feel like it was still worthwhile in that form. Yeah. Um, but about three years in, you know, I'm getting close to the time where I got to like leave college and start figuring out what I want to do for a job. And um, I didn't really have a whole lot of direction. And my teachers didn't really give me a whole lot of direction. You know, they were like, well, you can be a gallery artist, a graphic designer, or an interior designer. And I was like, there's got to be more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was young and I, and I didn't know. You don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. And um, so I ended up dropping out and just started working because, you know, I needed a roof over my head. I needed food in my belly. You just got to get started, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I was working retail, Victoria's Secret, the Hallmark store. Um, and eventually I started working at Star Clipper, which was a comic book store in St. Louis. Yeah. Okay. And while I was working there, um, I really started seeing the people behind comics and I'd always been interested in comics. Like I was watching, you know, Batman, the animated series and justice league, uh, when I was growing up, big fan of all of Dwayne McDuffie's animated series, static shock. Um, and then when I got to college, I met some other people who were also into comics and I started really getting in, you know, finding a comic book store of my own and, you know, borrowing graphic novels from the library. And that was like my my young adulthood. And so when I first started working at the uh, the comic book store, I was like, oh, this is this is something I can do. You know, I saw nice. <laughs> uh, Brittany Williams name on a Samurai Jack comic. And I had been following Brittany Williams for many years on Tumblr. And um, I and I think that's when I realized that that's something that I could do too, you know, because Brittany Williams is um, a Black femme person as well. And I was like, okay, well, if they can do it, I can do it, you know? And I don't think I really considered it as an option just because I didn't see people like myself doing comics and so when I found someone who looked like me doing it I was it kind of rocked my world and I was like this is what I actually want to do and so uh there's a collective here in St. Louis called Ink and Drink Comics and uh they meet up once a month talk about comics talk about writing and um it's a really cool program because they put together these anthologies from creators here in St. Louis, and they'll be based on like a genre of comics. So Westerns, romance, action, that sort of thing. And every, all the money that's made from those books gets put into making the next one. So no one is really making any money off of this, but it's just a really great way for young and new creators to learn the in and out of making a comic, you know? For uh, sure sharing it for print, how to work with collaborators, working with an editor, uh, selling the work at a table. So it was um, a really great opportunity. And I'm really glad that I was able to, to work with them because I think it kind of kickstarted my uh, comics career doing that. Yeah. And, uh, that was called Eat and Drink Comic. Is that still going on? Ink and Drink. So, Ink and Drink. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's definitely still going on. And actually, they're going to be at uh, Slice this year. So if you wanted to come by to Slice, um, they'll definitely be there. It will be for sure. For sure. Really yeah, fun. I'm going to try for it. When is that? Uh, Slice is October 26th. It's uh, going to be all from 10 a.m. to 5, 5 p.m. at uh, the Sheldon downtown. Yeah, I'm definitely going to see if, I, if I'm not too late to try and get on the... the yeah. Get in involved. Yeah. Absolutely. So... After I was working on that, I was really doing a lot more events at the comic book store. Um, I did like, you remember Angry Birds? Yeah. <laughs> well, we had Angry Bird plushies. And so I was like, we have all these boxes from our comics. Why don't we paint the boxes to look like the bricks and get a slingshot and people can come in and actually slingshot Angry Birds into bricks in our gallery space. Whoa. Gee. Yeah, it was really, really fun. And um, I think like even the news like came to the store to be like, play your own Angry Bird. And so I, I think it was, um, it not only was it a cool program, it was like a great program for me to realize that I can start making these programs all the time, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, so I started doing ladies nights. I did, uh, I started Comics University. Um, it is a free series where every Wednesday night you can come to the store and learn something about comics. I was mostly volunteer run. Um, and so I was doing all that programming and I was also still working on my drawing skills. And I ended up finding other people who also worked in comic book stores. And uh, I met my creative partner and uh, best friend, Ivy Noel Weir. And we were just, you know, talking about ideas for comics. And at one point she was like, do you want to make a web comic with me? And I was like, yeah, because, you know, I was doing like journal comics, just doodles here and there. And I really wanted to try some something long form because even the comics that were in Ink and Drink, they're only like six pages long maximum because it's an anthology, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, this is a really great opportunity for me to work on some long form work. And so we started working on our idea. Um, Ivy had this idea. She used to work at the Muter Museum, which is a medical oddities museum in Philadelphia. And as she was working there, cataloging these pieces of people, um, she was kind of losing her own sense of humanity. And so she ended up writing this uh, novella about someone who is trying to find the history of these people that had their bodies donated to the Muter Museum. And um, I was like, well, that sounds sick as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do it. Um, and so we started working on that webcomic. In the meantime, um, Star Clipper had closed. And so a lot of us had to find different jobs, um, a lot of the you know employees. And so I ended up working um, at the St. Louis Public Library, the central branch. And basically when I was like interviewing, I was like, listen, I know comics like the back of my hand. Also, <laughs> I make a ton of really successful events. And if you want that sort of thing at the library, you should hire me. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up working at the library. I was um, in their biography, literature and entertainment room. And so one of my first things to do was really uh, bolster their graphic novel memoir collection, because I feel like those sorts of books should also be in the biography section, you know? Yeah. Um, so and even if that means have one copy in the biography room and another copy in the graphic novel section, you know, that it's it's doable. So uh, then I also was working with some other librarians there to create a uh, zine library as well. Um, a lot of us had been to, you know, small conventions. We know of the zine culture and saw some other libraries starting their own zine collections. And so we were like, well, if these libraries can do it, we should do it too. And uh, it was a really stressful and challenging thing to do um, just because the library was not used to collecting things that were you know two inches by three inches oh yeah i'm sure they like tell them like well we can put them in slip bags i mean there are ways that we can keep these in circulation you yeah, know it's like this is more of a piece of art than it is a yeah. book it, yeah I, one uh, to reiterate on the library stuff so when you were a librarian or uh it do you have control over what they order and put on the shelves? So yes. how how would a creator go about trying to get in libraries, especially their local libraries? Hmm. Who so would they reach out to, the library itself or a librarian? I, I would reach out to a librarian, um, mostly because the way it works is librarians have an opportunity to buy books at the same time as anyone else. So same time as a bookstore, same time as a school, you know, and they use a lot of the similar ordering processes as well. So you can go into the library, speak to a librarian and be like, hey, my book is coming out and I would love for it to be in the library and then kind of state your case as to why it should be in there, you know? Um, the only thing is that the uh, actual book when it comes in goes through collection services and so they are the ones that really decide like where the book is located and how many copies that they're able to actually purchase. So, you know, talking to a librarian is probably the best way to go about it. Um, also, some libraries accept donations, you know, so I know I'm not exactly sure which libraries here in St. Louis accept them now, but um, I definitely have worked with libraries outside of St. Louis who are like, Absolutely, you know, give us some books to to put into the in the system. So, you know, it's very, very doable. You just kind of have to know who to ask. I was I would start with going to a librarian and be like, can we discuss collection services? Cause I love to have my book in the library. Okay. Yeah, kind of the same way you'd go about trying to get it into a local store. The That's same right. way getting it into that actual um 
Okay, yeah, continue yeah. forward. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm working at the library and Ivy and I are working on this web comic and we see that Oni Press is doing open submissions for the first time. And so we're like, hey, we should maybe pitch this because maybe it could be a graphic novel. And we were thinking to ourselves that we didn't really have anything to lose because if they said no, we were already going to put it online anyway. So it's not like we were like really putting all of our hopes and dreams into this, you know, this submission, but we submitted it and it got picked, which is really, really cool. I think they had like 600 people submit stuff and they picked like eight stories and ours was one of those eight. So it was um, really a wonderful and exciting um, process, but we also had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long was the thing that you submitted to them that they accepted? It was a full, was that the the web comic? Like how would you rate that as like pay, how many pages, I guess, so to speak? Yeah. So typically when you're submitting a pitch for a graphic novel, you'll send a- Oh, sample. the pitch. I'm sorry. I thought you- Yeah. I thought you submitted a, like a completed work. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no, no. It was just a pitch. We hadn't even started on putting the web comic together because Oni had just all of a sudden opened submissions and we were like, well, let's hold off on putting it online because if we get picked, then you know the company might have something to say about it being online. They might be like, "Well, you should have to take it down now." <laughs> you know? Gotcha. No, yeah, I, I miss. I was thinking like a competition or something like that. But you're uh, saying you yeah, submitted yeah. your pitch to Oni Press, yes. and how did you know that 600 people submitted? Oh, we asked. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Oh, gotcha. All right. Yeah, yeah. So after we had gotten it, which was really exciting, we were both like where do we start? So we definitely, I feel like I learned more about making graphic novels from the process of making a graphic novel than any other kind of workshop or class I've ever taken. And so that's why I always say to new creators and upcoming creators that um, just make the work you want to make. It doesn't matter if it is, you know, good or up to your own standards because your next work is going to be better, but you have to start somewhere, you know? So, um, so we got the book deal. We started working on the book. I'm working at the library, going to ALA and like doing librarian stuff. But I would like a raise, you know, and <laughs> librarians, unless they have a master's of library sciences, their, um, their pay does only goes so far. And I was not interested in going to grad school for librarianship because I already dropped out of school and I don't really care to do it. I also don't have the money for it. So I'm yeah. going to do something else. <laughs> and even then it's sort of probably like capped. It's like, I'm paying this much to get this much. <laughs> like, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And so as much as I loved it and I really did love it because there's as much as I, I really enjoy working at the comic book store because I like talking to people about comics and suggesting things and like really, you know, having that relationship. And it was even better at the library because then I didn't have to worry about, you know, a financial bottom line. So having to leave there, I was like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you're not getting paid enough, you have to move on, you know? Yeah. Um, and so uh, I'm looking for new jobs. Ivy sees this. Um, uh, job opening at Lion Forge, which was a publisher here in St. Louis. I remember for... they got bought out by somebody, right? No. Oh, no. okay. They actually, per I'll, I'll get to it. I'll get okay, to okay. it. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so I was like, it was a social media and community management position. And because I had been so involved in the arts community here in St. Louis and in the community um outside of St. Louis because I was a part of a group of uh, comic book retailers as well. And because I had a background in libraries and I was going to cons and I was just very connected. I felt like this was a great position for me. For sure. and, um, and so I ended up getting the job, which was really great. Um, and I was doing social media for a while, uh, doing a lot of like making sure that our creators got to their panels on time at conventions. And I mean, we were at so many conventions. I think at the most I had ever done, I think I did like 13 conventions in a year. It was a lot. And I didn't have a whole lot of like work life balance, which oh, yeah. was also not very good, but I feel like that's the like the nature of being in your mid twenties is not knowing where to draw that line and, uh -huh. you know, focusing on that work. Um, and so eventually um, what they do when they are, when Lion Forge is 
picking new titles, they have like a pitch meeting. And so we see all these pitches come in, we look over these pitches and we decide, is this a book that we want at the company? And what was really great because this company was so small, there was a representative from every department at those pitch, uh, pitch meetings. And so I was there representing the social media and marketing department and you know offering my suggestions and my comments and my thoughts. And through that, they asked, they were like, listen, Steens, you're great at social media, but would you like to move over into editorial? And I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, I don't really like change. Um, you're not really going to give me a pay increase. So why would I just switch, you know? Um, and so they, they were like, well, before you officially say no, let's talk about it. You know, like, what is it that you want to do with your career? Like, what is it that you're most focused on? And I said that I really wanted to make sure that marginalized creators had an open door to comics. Because when I started, I didn't even see anybody that looked like me. So I didn't even consider that this could be an opportunity, you know? So I wanna make sure that those opportunities are there for people. And I was able to do that as a community manager. I was hosting dinners, I was putting people in front of editors, you know, which is all really great. Um, but they were like, but you can do more as an editor because now you're putting money in these people's pockets. And I was like, that's a good point. Okay, I'll switch. <laughs> and so I moved over to editorial. At this point now, my book is out. It's doing great. Archival Quality is the name of the first book. Um, we think it did pretty well. Uh, we ended up getting uh, the Dwayne McDuffie Award for Diversity for it, which was really, really cool. Nice. And uh, Yeah, so it was like, I know, I felt like this was a really cool time for me. You know, my, my first book was coming out. I was still doing anthologies. Those anthologies were getting awards, which meant I was getting those awards. Um, and so people, I also made a lot of connections with people in the industry as I was working for that publisher. Because, you know, when you go to a lot of conventions, you meet a lot of different people, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just if you ended could up fill us in on what it, from the creator's perspective, what it was like on the other end of someone, mm -hmm. the round table what made you choose the ones that you published and what yeah. made you shun some away? Um, for me, I wanted to make sure that the stories felt complete. A lot of pitches, they think that they just have to do the elevator pitch and that's it, but that's not the case. If you don't have an ending for your book, no publisher is going to buy it because they need to know for sure that you know how to execute on this idea that you're given, you know? And so I found that a lot of pitches were just unrealized and unfinished. Um, other ones that I did decide to take on were from people who had made comics before. And so even if those comics weren't like, you know, big publisher comics, even if they were like small press, 10, 15 page comics that they're selling at cons, seeing people can actually complete and finish those pieces of work and people like those pieces of work, then this pitch must be good. You know, it must have some value to it. And, um, it was really a great opportunity for me to learn what kind of things people are looking for. You know, they're looking for uh, a good demographic representation. They're looking for, uh, does this appeal to people outside of the comics industry? Um, do we need to pick something that isn't already done? I mean, there's uh, we have plenty of pitches where it's like, oh, this sounds like something that exists already, you yeah, know? Sure. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a lot of different things that, um, help a publisher decide if this is the, the book that they want to go for. And also it's about who the creator is as well. Cause I mean, obviously you're selling the book, but you're going to be taking the creator to cons, you know, you're going to be taking the creator to book signings. And so they have to be um, exciting for people to want to meet and talk to. Um, you need people who are good at talking on panels cause they're probably going to be put on a panel at a convention talking about their book. So it's a lot of things. It's How many did you guys publish per month, I guess? To... Or how many new titles did you take on per year? And how many were brand new creators? Like that was, yeah. it might have been their first or second book. I mean, it's been a while since I worked there, you know? So I was oh, saying. Yeah, <laughs> you don't need to give me the, the specific. Yeah. <laughs> if but you knew I mean, off the I top of your there, head. It, when I was there, it definitely felt like at least like. 10 to 15 books a year and okay. when it came to like single issue comics we're talking like maybe two or three a month um two series, gotcha. two series okay 
yeah and that's a small publisher you know bigger yeah, publishers yeah. do way more <laughs> but you know you only have so much money <laughs> when you're a small publisher and well that's um, what i was thinking i was like even with small press you probably re re don't release that many one or two a month and so you probably still get a lot of submissions you know yep. probably 20 to 50 per month or something like that so oh yeah it, it sounds like a lot of people don't have they're just very broad ideas that aren't you're they're not like in process or in production or even like finished right. or anything like that so you that's can right. weed a lot of them out right yep. away yep exactly and actually that's what it's called a, a slush pile all of the ones that we can just uh, this one's not gonna work at all you know yeah it's typically the assistant editors go through this slush pile <laughs> and the uh, senior editors do more of the actual like production stuff um but yeah there's a lot of pitches and because there are so many you get good at recognizing what's good and what's not you know yeah so okay, yeah so f from lion forge on yes so eventually lion forge decided that they wanted to purchase oni press and i oh, was like okay what a decision <laughs> because you know my book is at oni press yeah and uh also, I don't think purchasing a, a company is, I don't know, I don't want to get too detailed into like why I was not a big fan of their choice to merge just because it's like industry work that I don't think I can share. But yeah, yeah. But overall, they purchased Oni Press and in that merger, loads of people were let go. And I was one of those people that were let, was let go. And that's um, wild. Yeah, yeah. Dang, I wish I wish we could go into it, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I that think is point, because I knew something like that had happened, but I didn't realize that Lion Forge was the one actually buying it. I was thinking it was yes. the opposite way. Wow. Yeah, no, the person that owns Lion Forge is filthy rich. <laughs> filthy. But uh, th that's interesting because the I always, from secondhand word of mouth, knew of Lion Forge as the place to go nationwide for the marginalized community so if you were yeah. the one that pushed that as like sort of the the mar the marketing or like what they're known for yeah. you're the one that did the job the best because yes. that's what i knew lion for jazz and i was like that's right. well that's right where i'm at uh, yeah and then yeah. yeah so that's interesting yeah very very wild to to a point that i like when I was let go, I had to request from Oni, like, I need some, like, documentation that my not being at Lion Forge isn't going to affect my book at Oni Press, you know? Yeah. Um, I need there to be a very clear separation of church and state there. Um, at that so, point, where had, how far had your book, are, so it was released as solely a graphic mean, novel? At, yes. And it had its initial print run, I'm assuming. And yep. then was it, like, a you don't have to give the details on how five years or whatever, but I'm assuming, did they already, did you know something else was coming down the line? Like they're going to do a specialized print run or something like no, that? No, no, that's not okay. usually how it works. Typically uh, it is they give you like a five year publishing contract. And then mm -hmm. after that five years, it's kind of up to you what you want to do with it. We can either renew this contract or you can take the uh, copyright back. But and, within that five years, had that how far along in your contract were you at? At the point uh, so the book came out happened? in 2018, and I was let go in 2019. So, oh, so yeah, so it was right away. Yeah. So you still <laughs> had you still had years on your contract, so you would years. want to figure out like, if I don't have control over this, let me know what you're gonna do. Exactly. Exactly. So I still had like four years on the contract, which means I have four years still being attached to lion forge in a certain in a certain way you know which yeah i didn't really want to be considering they fired me that's so crazy you know? to be uh an like almost an executive level person that's also a creator and now you're like stuck on the back end that you i would feel worried that they were just gonna shun it to the side and pretend it never happened or something i mean i wouldn't say i was in like executive level there were definitely <laughs> people above me <laughs> But I was there and I was doing good work, you know, and I knew that they weren't going to mistreat the book, but I did know with the amount of people that they let go, that they weren't going to be doing very well, you know, with their entire new system, which I found out to be true. So by the time my five-year contract was up, I was like, I won't be renewing. We decided oh, to yeah. <laughs> let it lapse. And so archival quality is 
out of print at the moment, which is sad because it is my first book and I do love it, but I would much rather it be out of print than in the hands of people I don't trust. <laughs> you For know? sure, yeah. Yeah. So after I left, I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I'm a freelancer now. I never wanted to be a freelancer. I really enjoy having steady income. <laughs> and, um, but I found that I had some very clear skills, you know, that I took away from this job and previous jobs. And one of those was pitch production and pitch editorial. And so I opened up my business, my editorial business, essentially, to help people with their pitches. And so I would give them a full rundown of what's working, what's not working, here are the things that you actually need. I would uh, workshop it with people so that I would have a full contract with them and we work on it for the entire time. Um, I ended up people asking me to edit some of their magazines. I got editing work at Tapas, um, which is, I think you, you know what Tapas is. It's like similar to like yeah, Webtoon. Yeah, Webtoon, so I'm, yeah. Yeah. And um, so I was doing a lot of editorial work and I was doing some illustration work as well. So I was making it as I needed, but it was it was still very stressful because just the, the manner, the nature of freelance is you're never really sure when that money is going to come in, you know? And yeah. um, but I did realize that I had a lot more free time on my hands. And because I had that free time on my hands, I had a much better relationship with my work in my life than I did when I was working at the publisher. And so I had a really great opportunity to make the comics that I actually wanted to make, um, not just uh, ones that I felt were going to sell well. So I had this dream, this idea to um, make a Encyclopedia Brown comic. Did you ever read Encyclopedia Brown growing up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, these are perfect. You know, they're short little mysteries. One of those mysteries can be adapted into a comic. I could sell it at shows. And so that's what I did. I adapted it into a comic. I definitely made it a fanzine. So I was like, this, I don't own this. <laughs> I was going to say, is that public domain? It might be. It's not. Scholastic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Scholastic owns it. So I definitely was like, this is just fan work, you know, for I'm not trying to rebrand Encyclopedia Brown. Um, but I did that and I took it to shows because, you know, now that I have my book out, Archival Quality, and I had the other anthologies that I was in and I had Encyclopedia Brown. So I was like, I have enough stuff to go to shows. So I should be going to shows. And having worked at Lion Forge and done so many shows, I was like, this is going to be a piece of cake. I know exactly what I'm doing now, you know? And so it was really great. I had a great, you know, 2019, 20, early 2020 year of going to shows and stuff. And at one of the shows, I went to SPX, the Small Press Expo in Beth Bethesda, Maryland. And yeah. I met uh, an, an editor there. I did not actually speak to them. They just went by my table, bought some stuff, and um, they reached out to me and my agent afterward. And they were like, hey, I can see that you are really great at taking established characters and revamping it for a new audience. You've also done a lot of editorial work, so you know about keeping on a really great time schedule. How do you feel about syndicated comics? And I was like, syndicated comics, newspapers? That sounds great. I mean, like I had grown up reading newspapers, I would say, the majority of people our age, those are the first comics they read were in the newspaper. And uh, so it was a really exciting opportunity. Um, I talked with my agent about it and she was like, listen, I've never, you know, um, represented someone who does syndication, but if you're in, I'm in. And so I did my audition series of figuring out if they want me to revamp the series. And after about four weeks of that process, um, I got the job. And so Heart of the City was a comic that started in 2001. Um, it was when Phantom Menace came out. <laughs> I, I remember this because the first storyline is the, one of the characters wanting to write their own version of Phantom Menace because they hate it the new one or something ridiculous. <laughs> but um, Mark Tatuli lives in Philadelphia and he created the series and it was a daily series and he was doing it every day until like 2020 when he was like, I want to step away. It had been 20 years and 20 years of doing a daily comic. I completely understand wanting to step away and do something else. You know, he wanted to do more long form graphic novels, wanted to focus on his other syndicated series. And so instead of just stopping it, he sold it to Andrews McMeal Syndicate. And Andrews McMeal is the one who reached out to me and was like, do you want to continue this series and revamp it? And so wow. that's what we're doing since April of 2020. 
So you yeah. you write and do everything. Uh, yes. You just took over that series. So he sold yeah. it to the <laughs> to them, and, and then they were seeking for just someone to fill his role, and they found yeah. you, yeah. and and you filled that gap. That's amazing. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that was all going to that, that expo in Maryland. That's called the small I, press expo, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that was a part of it. I also think, you know, Sheena just kind of knew of who I was just because of the work that I was doing. Oh, of course. Also, yeah. Like your background played a part. It's not like I would just show it up there. Yeah. And like, <laughs> see my face and like her. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So but it, no, it that's amazing to just showcase how uh, I try to, even though I don't do it as enough myself but i encourage people there's so many that uh don't realize how important it is to be active in multiple spaces you can't just oh, write yeah. something and put it out once you know right. you've got to there's multiple different mediums that your comics can be a part of and then you need to be mm -hmm. out in the space both yep. online and in person yep. and people are like i'm not gonna go to to conventions like to sell three books and it's like you don't do it for the for that you know it's yeah, things like that happen to you community. there's all kinds of opportunities it's collaboration meeting being a part of the community that's right i mean some of my i feel like some of my closest friends are all people that i met at conventions mm -hmm. you know i have friends that we like travel together and we like stay at each other's houses whenever we travel and it's like all because we met at a con and so you know, it was going to conventions. It was doing the work that I was doing. I was also really into like community building. So, you know, that group I was telling you about of comic book retailers, I was an admin for that group. I started a separate group for mar um, BIPOC of marginalized gender who are in comics. I was an admin for a, a group like that. So it's like, I had my fingers in a lot of pots, you know? And I would also I know- Although I'm sure you know this from your own perspective, but from my perspective, you have your own very professional brand about you. Yeah. The, from the way you dress to the to the to your website to all the commun yeah. all the things you've created and all the things you're a part of, that package, you just just your aura and energy being at a place, I feel like you bring all that together. So if someone yeah. were to say who has all the you know the business savvy the creative skill the networking the the energy involved that it takes to take over something a, a such something as you know being the sole creator of a big series or you know uh, mm -hmm. working for a company that you know works with a lot of, you have the energy that they would that needs to that puzzle piece that's required and i feel like just your image that you present yourself as plays a part of that it, you know, you're not just a, uh, I can't, I don't know how to explain it, like, other than visually, like, fashion is involved, <laughs> you know, because some yeah. people just show up and, and they yeah. just think, here's my table or here's the thing I've done where yeah, your you whole energy like, about you is an yeah. aspect to everything. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely think that someone once said that, um, gosh, I was doing a, a an interview and someone had, had they had interviewed someone else about me and they said, Steens has a why not attitude. And it's true. I do. You know, I take opportunities as they come. I, even if I don't know if I'm good enough to do it, you know, because I have to re remind myself like the opportunity came for a reason, you know, so maybe I am good enough to do it. Um, but yes. Yeah, so as I was doing uh, those cons and as a freelancer, um, one of the people from Ink and Drink works at Webster and he just got a, um, a promotion. And so now so he was the, uh, head of the communications and animation department at Webster. And because of that promotion, he could no longer teach his cartooning course. He just didn't have the time for it. And so he asked me, seeing that I was without a job, <laughs> was like, do you want to teach it? Because, you know, you have the background in teaching comics because I did that. Comics University program. I also do pitch editorial, which I think is a form of education as well. And so um, he asked if I wanted to do it. And I was like, yeah, FYI, I didn't graduate college. Can I still do that? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you have like droves of experience, you know, and that experience matters, especially when it comes to, I feel like a lot of adjunct professors are 
working in the field and teaching. And so they bring that value to their classes. You know, they're not saying do this because I'm a teacher and I said so. They're saying do this because I'm literally in the industry and this is what everyone else is doing. And you that's, know? those are the teachers we all like and enjoy and actually go yeah. to the professors <laughs> we don't care about. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And uh, so here I am, I'm doing Heart of the City, I'm teaching, and I'm thinking about my next book. And um, one of the creators that I worked with at Lion Forge, I was just, you know, the community manager, and they were one of the writers. Um, we ended up becoming closer friends just from seeing each other at multiple cons and doing a bunch of stuff together. And um, he was saying that he wanted to do a nonfiction book on the history of tabletop role-playing games. And one of the projects that I did at Lion Forge was Rolled and Told. It was a uh, TTRPG magazine, very similar to Dungeon Magazine and Dragon Magazine, where every issue you get a new module that you can put into your own campaign. It'll give you all the stat blocks, all the storytelling. There were articles about TTRPGs, um, artwork. It was a really great, um, a really great project. And so Sam, he was like, um, you know, would you want to do it with me? And I was thinking, you know, I don't really care about TTRPGs like that. I, I just happened to do it because it was assigned to me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I ended up being like in that industry because of it. You know, I ended up learning so much more about it and just being so much more into it doing those 12 issues. And um, so I was like, yeah, let's do it. Because I've always wanted to do Nonfiction work. I love nonfiction comics. Like anything that Box Brown done does, I'm like obsessed with. <laughs> I love nonfiction. And so I was like, this would be a really great opportunity for me to learn how to work with someone else because other other times I had just been working with my partner Ivy. And it would also be a good way for me to learn how to do nonfiction comics because I'd only been doing doing fiction before that. So I was like, this should be a good experience. And so we pitched that and ended up getting picked up also in 2020. So 2020 was a big, big year for me. You know, I had Heart of the City. I was teaching. I had the new TCRPG book. I was also buying a house. So it was just, you know, a lot was going on. Um, and uh, now uh, I'm like four years into Heart of the City. We're still doing good. Um, I've, in, I've been teaching at Webster. I'm considering in 2025 and on um, adding another class because I only do fall semester. So I, I'm thinking about adding spring semester as well. And uh, what else? And then side quest, that's the TCRPG book that comes out in October of this year. So I'm working on all of this stuff, doing all these things. And uh, someone from WashU reaches out to me because they were like, listen, do you remember STL Specs, which was the St. Louis Small Press Expo. And I was like, absolutely, I remember it. I was a volunteer every year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really loved it. I thought it was such a, a cool program. And, um, you know, I wasn't a part of like the planning committee. I had a job and like other things to do. And in my 20s, remember, I had no good work-life balance. <laughs> uh -huh. But work. I did have time to volunteer. And so I volunteered every year I, I could, went to all the shows and then it stopped happening during the pandemic. And so in 20, late 2022, Tate Foley reaches out to me and is like, we're thinking about restarting it. Um, do you want to be on the, you know, the planning, the organizing committee? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so we got some new team, new people. Um, we rebranded it from St. Louis Small Press Expo to Slice. Um, I wanted it to match the other expos that were happening. So like MICE, and rice these are all independent expos that use that same kind of naming and so it was like st louis independent comics expo there it is so um we switched it to slice we got a new mascot uh their name is mr slice <laughs> and nice. uh the first year that slice happened was 2023 last year and it was really really well attended we had over 800 attendees over 100 vendors we had uh, three special guests. I mean, it was a really wonderful experience and I think a really successful expo. And so I'm really looking forward to uh, 2024. Um, we've got some really cool ideas set up. Do you know there. where what location you'll be at this year? We're going to be at the Sheldon again. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, I, uh, there's another guy out here that's a comic creator the, uh, named Rick DeRee. 
that he is also, he was a teacher at, I want to say Lindenwood for like 20 years. Um, and anyway, but he started the Heroic Awards, which oh, okay. had their first um, annual award ceremony at C2E2 this year. Oh, cool. And I helped, and I helped him with that. And he is in the process of trying to start what he's going to call I'm In, which stands for Imagine Indie. Uh, and he's trying to do kind of like a full blown South by Southwest. Oh, wow. Um, comics, film, um, I think even video games, uh, a huge wow. kind of thing here in St. Louis. And he's actively in the process of okay. getting everyone involved, vendors, yeah. finding locations. And, and he was, uh, and they haven't chosen a location. And he was thinking about going to different places each year or something. He's pretty. He's he's still in the mode of it's bigger in his mind before mm -hmm. than it probably will be, especially at its first one this year. But that yeah, he's trying to have start one. later this year, I think. Yeah. Well, um, you know, if he needs any advice or anything, he can always. Oh, reach I'm out. definitely gonna connect him with you. Uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and... definitely reach out. And then also, you know, our applications are we get we did an extension, so our applications are open till the seventh now. And so, you know, so I've got a few days to apply. You got a few days. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm going to get on there after this. I, I have yeah, a, a, quite do. a few notes that I, I, I'm taking on this. Uh, ink and drink, mm -hmm. slice. I knew of slice and I actually, I think I looked it up last year or maybe earlier this year. And, and it like, I wasn't prepared to what I was going to do yet because yeah. I had, I have a million things going on as well. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I try to do way more than I'm actually able to do. So I always yeah. end up over my skis every year. Um, but I can at least be consistent on YouTube. Yeah. We got <laughs> one thing. <laughs> right. Dang, you but are yeah. a plethora of knowledge. I it, it's And you're one of the most unique stories of people that I've brought on here. Oh, that's uh, great. A, as far as somebody that your start was... I feel like the the avenue that no one sees the mm. the avenue of actual what it's like in the comic shop, what it's like yeah. uh, in libraries, mm -hmm. the 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 not the back end, really like the front end. Like whenever you're a writer or an artist and you're just sort of taking ideas and putting them into form, you don't see how they actually what actually sells or what That's kind right. of people get into shops, and you you knew how to create events to bring people into shops and utilize the stuff that you have in the shop in order to, you know, bring more within the angry birds that you're talking about and all that kind of stuff like that is so outside of most people's realms. I feel like, you know, yeah. it, it, it's just, so it's, it's really, it's, it's obvious on from me why you, every step you go, you have a bigger and better job, a new series like that that come to you because you have exactly the right energy and skill sets and ambition um, to in order to to grow your bubble like that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, like you would be a no wonder you're a teacher because you would be exactly <laughs> what people need to to learn from. And that yeah, brings me back to the the I wanted to find out. Do you do lectures at all locally? Or I do. At, okay. I do. So I do lectures on my own so people can reach out and like schedule that. But I also work with the VLAA. It's the Volunteer Lawyers and Accountants for the Arts. It's a nonprofit that um, basically helps artists, uh, any kind of artist. So not just, you know, drawing or anything, but painters, ceramicists, um, musicians, that sort of thing, and helps them with uh, co contracts, taxes, uh, bookkeeping, if you have any question about the actual business side of being a working artist, that's what the VLAA does. And so they have a program called the Upstart Program, where they have a couple of different working artists, and they send those creators to universities to talk to them about those important things. And so I talk about contracts and copyright and IP and taxes and self-employment tax and all this, like the boring stuff <laughs> that comes with being a working artist but necessary stuff because if you want to be successful you have to have all your ducks in a row you know you have to know how to um, negotiate you have to know how to file your taxes and a lot of times 
that sort of information is not taught anywhere. You know, what class do you go to to learn about copyright law in high school? You know, uh, economics, I guess, but barely, you know, and they, no one talks about quarterly taxes and when to pay those and why that's better or why an LLC would be good for someone versus just, um, you know, a sole proprietor. So I do teach those sorts of programs. Um, and I have found that in my experience of all of my experiences, I'm finding that I really love teaching the most, like obviously making comics is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm getting a lot more fulfillment from teaching, which is why I like to increase my teaching as I get, you know, older and into my career. I feel you there. That's pretty much why I started doing YouTube. I felt I had to just get all the stuff that I learned from doing this out there. And yeah. then once you, once I started doing it, I enjoyed that more than being alone, writing the scripts all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and you like, know, <laughs> I, 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 I understand like how fun it is to make comics. I really do. I like, I love making zines. I love the feeling of like having a finished piece working on a story that you know i had trouble with and getting it figured out and it's great but you're right it's a kind of a lonely existence you know you spend a lot of time by yourself working and yesterday i actually had or two days ago i actually had a vlaa program that i went to and i could tell that there was one student in there in that class who was like super locked in like taking all kinds of notes had so many questions about comics and just really was excited to see what you can do in the future. And that excitement that I saw, even though they were, you know how teens are, they don't want to show it, but you can tell, you can tell when they're really, really interested and they're really grateful. And that alone, I was like, I want to see more of that. You know, I want to yeah. see more of that inspiration coming out and people feeling like, oh my gosh, I know what to do. I, I know where to go, you know? Yeah, that's... Even if you just get one, I did a lecture no. at high school <laughs> Two, I want to say like two years ago, I did a lecture and I just asked how many of you want to work in comic books? Nobody yeah. cared. How many yeah. of you are interested in writing as a career or filmmaking or acting or any, nobody cared. Yeah. I was like, what is happening? I was like, whenever <laughs> I was your age, everybody in the classroom would have been that's it, 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 it was crazy to me but then after that i had one person that was like everything you said i like i want to know everything else that you can tell me like he was interested yeah. but just didn't express it to, in front of the class yeah. i guess it was yeah. just, and but it still like shocked me that no nobody was interested in the arts there was one person that said they wanted to be an actor yeah, and, I think, nobody was interested in art or art or uh, I think a part of that comes from these governments stripping arts from curriculums, you know, like if you yeah, don't have or some, an art class, if you don't have a drama class, if you don't have ceramics, like you don't know what you don't know. And mm -hmm. so if they never have an art class or have any sort of way to express themselves artistically and creatively. They just won't, you know, and, they won't even consider yeah. it, you know. They just don't see it as a career or something. Yeah. That's what that yeah. was what my whole lecture was about. I was like trying to yeah. explain like there is multiple avenues to make this a career. And it's not yeah. just a I have to go to Hollywood and hope they accept me like it, it's not That's like right. that in the real world. Yeah. Um, but I, I in other avenues, people came to me and they just it, it's it's as if. And I felt you feel this in the in the that is why we get into comics, because if you go for filmmaking to school, the, the dark side on the other end is most of the time you're not filming movies. You know, yeah. you're getting a job uh, as a videographer for a corporation or a studio, mm -hmm. and it's very much just another office job like anything else. Most of the time doing graphic design or something that you don't actually like to do tedious work. It's the creative fun aspect is taken away. And I think that a lot of our generation is learned that and the younger generations already know it. And so they're just like, they see TikTok or a lot of the social media aspects and movie making and comics are so not a part of their zeitgeist as much as it was for you and I. I, I think it has 
And I think it's largely to do with the lack of education and opportunity, you know? For sure. I think if they, like I was just in my last class, I was saying if I had a working artist come to the class and talk about the like 50 different jobs you can have with an art degree, I would not have dropped out, you know? And yeah. so I think that that's a part of it. You know, if you don't have anyone telling you, this is what you can do, these are your options. You're never going to know and you're never going to be interested in knowing because you just, you don't know what you don't know. You it know? Seems that's like why I think it's important to do programming like this, you know? do programming like slice and go to classes and do podcasts you know it's it's just so that that information is out there you know otherwise where else are they going to get it exactly is is your like business and accounting aspects of what you teach available as a class at webster so i only teach cartooning which is like the basic 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 basicness of yeah comics. but it seems but like halfway, that's what they should be teaching as well is that yeah 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 and that's what i do so for the first half of the class is all about the actual like learning of the comics and the different parts of a comic and what it goes into cartooning and then the last half of the class while they're working on their final i'm giving them lectures on being a, a working creative in the real world so how to market yourself um how to do taxes and contracts awesome um, so your whole your class is a holistic thing of the business yes. of being in an active cartoonist awesome that's that's, right. that's awesome so that's you right. are at least are are you're ch you're changing yeah. the, the spectrum academia oh, yeah. is actually changing for the better with you in it i i would say so and i don't even i mean listen i'm one of those kind of professors that like tells the student if you don't want to be here just, just drop go. out. Yeah. Just go. Because I mean, like, listen, it's their money. You know, I'm not, when it's K-12, it's like federally, you have to be there. But once it comes to the university, you don't have to be here, you know? And I'm not going to, I try and be incredibly like lax with it because I just think that Gen Z have it really, really, really hard. You know, everything has gotten harder. Everything's gotten more expensive. There are less opportunities. And even though they are being sold the American dream, I really feel like they are never going to attain it in the world that we are in right now. Right. So yeah, exactly. Make it as easy as possible for them so that when they do get out there, they're not like completely up shit's Creek, you know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's exactly right to where it's, it's as if the, the barrier to entry is easier, but the competition is fierce and the like you said the opportunities are less and yeah, it, yeah in this environment there, needs to be a lot of, there just needs to be a lot of ways you know i i think there's always going to be an opportunity to you know draw for somebody but i like to teach them to like take what they know and use that you know when, when i had lost my job i talked to my mentor who was the editor-in-chief at time who also lost her job <laughs> We both got fired same day. Um, Who did they keep? Her. Like, I don't understand. Just one person? Just, I don't know. You yeah, don't have to dive like in, but. People. Crazy. But basically, I was like feeling like I didn't really have any options because a lot of traditional publishers don't see comics publishers as legitimate. And so even though I have a huge background of editing comics, there's no way I would ever get a job at like a Scholastic or a Macmillan because I've never worked as an assistant at a Scholastic or a Macmillan. And she was like, well, instead of looking for jobs with that title, ask yourself, what is it that you want to do every day when you wake up? And I was like, okay, I want to edit comics. I want to draw comics. And I want to do something community focused, whether it's teaching or organizing or something like that. And she was like, but you need to do that. You need to do that and you need to find a way to monetize that. And I was like, okay, so how would I do that? And so that's when I decided to do pitch editorial and pitch reviews because I was like, that's what I'm good at. That's what I want to do. And if I say that I'm able, available to do that sort of thing, people will look into it. You know, people will say, hey, look at my pitch. And people did, you know, I was able to, live off of doing that freelance for a full year before I got part of the city, which is now my main source of income. But um, 
you know, I was able to do it. So you just have to get creative and uh, not let people tell you that there's only one way to succeed, you know, and you have to have a different definition of what success is for you. You know, I'm not a millionaire, <laughs> you know, I'm not making a ton of money, but I'm making enough where my bills are paid and I am fulfilled with the work that I do. And I feel like that is that. Yeah, that's the dream. I think Dave Chappelle famously said his his dad asked him uh, whenever his dad is frowning on his career in comedy. He's like, you won't make anything. He said, well, you're a teacher. If I can make a teacher's salary doing comedy, then I then I'm I win. I made it. And you are that's you're in the same scenario to where you are making a living making doing yeah. comics. There's your where you're at. There is so few people doing it's it's almost like the amount of people that are headlining comedi comedians. It's a very yeah. tough spot to get where you're at to have the skill level uh, and to everything about you to be able to make a full time living as a comic creator. There's even just an active full time writer. Uh, yeah. or even to get a job in the industry at all um these are it's a highly competitive industry yeah it's super competitive and a lot of it is luck you know what are the chances that that editor was even at that show you know what are the chances that i was even able to go to that show you know i almost didn't go because i didn't have like a place to stay and then a friend of mine was like you can stay with me so it's like it's a lot of things that lead up to it and you just have to be open and ready to take on those opportunities as well. Exactly. And having the knowledge that the majority of people out here are doing multiple jobs. There's yeah. not really a lot of people who are just doing their nine to five. And so I would really love for teachers and educators to stop selling that lie because I think that the majority of people that I know anyway are doing multiple things. Even if it's like, something small on the side that really fulfills them. You know, like my uh, twin sister for a long time was working in nonprofits, making, you know, a regular salary. But on the side, she was doing cosplay because she loves it. She loves cosplay so, so much. And that's what was fulfilling her. And it's like, those interact with each other in different ways. And it's normal to have two different things that you like to do. And it's normal to have multiple jobs. And it's normal to go from job to job and figure out what you want to do. And what you're doing when you're in your early 20s may not be the same thing that you're doing in your 30s or in your 40s or in your 50s and so on. So just the knowledge that life is messy, work is messy, and you have to just be open to opportunities and recognize some people are luckier than others, but do what you can with what you've got. Yeah. I, I to as a close to a final note, I want to state how a lot of the the nonfiction books that I write and that and the the this whole YouTube channel is about is showcasing how that it's okay and in fact encouraged to do exactly what you're doing. That mm -hmm. It's it, a lot of people that get into this space or think about getting into it or that reach out to me, they think that what they want to do or what is, this world is, is you just create comics every day and you're mainly like a manga artist that is dedicated to one series and that's it for years. I'm just, yeah. you know, and, and it's like very that that level of creator is super small. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the, it almost, yeah, like celebrity status worldwide yeah. kind of creator. Most of yeah. us that are active in the industry, exactly like why, if you were to go to school to figure out how can I be an artist as my career, this is what you learn is you have your own creative projects that you're doing on your own. You're writing for a series or a syndicate. You are also teaching you it's, and these aren't like, crazy to where you're juggling a million things it's uh yeah. that it there's a way to make it work and uh it's, comics aren't the only way that works even people yeah. that are out in uh film and, and all at video games they're doing the same thing they're doing their own yeah. projects while also writing about the yeah. industry while also teaching and they do a day job doing graphic design or uh yeah. storyboarding also, or whatever for it, corporates it's also good to uh, to remember that it does take a village as well you know 
uh, I have a spouse, <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's really helpful to be able to split the cost of those bills. And, um, you know, our income goes up and down. Sometimes he makes more than me. Sometimes I make more than him, you know, and it's just like being able to have people that you can rely on and be a part of that village really helps. Even if it's like someone to look over your work before you send it, you know, anytime you're about to send a stressful email, you do have that one person that you can send it to and say, Hey, can you look at this email before I send it? And it's the same way with every other part of your life. You do need to have a network, uh, a community. And that's why I say, instead of calling it networking, when you're reaching out, you call it community building because you're building a community of people that you can rely on who can rely on you and having that help is really really helpful and it gives you more confidence to do stuff you know because if you're doing it alone and you're sitting in your office by yourself you can really get in your head and um getting out of the house touching grass <laughs> all of that is quite important as well for sure that's i was going to end on the the more fun not all about business and career mode yeah and <laughs> more of like i used to read about writers that would go for a swim in the middle of the day or uh, like what uh, do you do? Uh, what are your hobbies if this is your job? Man, I have a lot of hobbies. So I roller skate. Um, I do like, so there are like four major like roller skating cities and they each have their own different style of skating and St. Louis's style is ballroom style skating. So I do uh, partner skating, uh, roller skating. And uh, I also crochet. I'm currently working on my twin sister's uh, baby blanket. She's having her first child this year. So I'm awesome. um, doing that. Um, I love to bake. Uh, I've been buying a lot of those like um, IP cookbooks. So like cook cooking things from Pokemon or from Final Fantasy. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. So yeah. I love doing those. Um, I like to build Gundams. Really, really love doing that. Um, and, what are you building? Oh, I guess you're an artist, so you you make it work. It's not like you're building them out of Legos or something. Oh no no no! So like Gundams come in like model kits, so you get oh, like okay yeah yeah yeah, and then you you put them together based on the the directions that come in the kits. So yeah, I like building model kits, and I love doing um activity book stuff. So like I have a book of crosswords and like word finds and mazes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, those kinds of like kid activity books, man. I love those. <laughs> that you, you should, yeah, I feel like you'd be someone that could make your own. Oh, dude, I I do. So I, I anytime I don't have an idea for a Sunday, I'm putting a word find in the comic. <laughs> oh, that dang. Yeah, you can take over the whole back section. You're the one That's who right. creates the Sudokus and <laughs> writing the, the comic strips. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and video games. I play a ton of video games. I love cozy puzzle video games. Um I love classic video games, you know, like Pokemon. Um, I watch movies, uh, all sorts of stuff. You know, I got to okay. get out of the house. Got to have multiple hobbies, you know. Otherwise, you start to hate what you do. <laughs> no, yeah. See, that that's where I'm at to where the comics aspect was my hobby. That yeah. then I tried to, that since it's my hobby and I have a day job where I manage a hotel out here. Mm -hmm. I it it now it's like dang it my hobbies became work and yeah. now my now my fun is basically watching movies with my kids and yeah. now I can't watch the stuff I want to watch with them because they're little I can't yeah. watch the new House of Dragon I can't watch <laughs> any of the I can't watch the 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 anything adult stuff and even they're so young that uh it's hard to even get them into live action everything yeah. is still they want to watch animated stuff which i'm still all about but they sure. don't uh, i'm happy that they're into a lot of the eastern influence stuff so yeah. as soon as i showed them spirited away they were like all about <laughs> everything else so i was just like, okay now you gotta go on a studio ghibli marathon and <laughs> yeah they're, they're all about it now so that's great. well this has been great i uh yeah. i think we're at an hour and um oh. i want to uh just whatever it, it is what's your website and send me your links and we'll we'll shout out whatever you have coming up next or you have actively yeah. right now if you want to promote anything 
Yeah, great. So uh, my name is Steens. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I have an Instagram <laughs> that you can follow. Um, I have a TikTok where I put my roller skating videos. Um, my next book, Side Quest, is coming out October 8th, 2024. Um, I will likely be having a book opening at Betty's Books in Webster Groves. And I might have a signing at Slice. We'll see. I'm usually real busy that day, you know, <laughs> making sure everything is running well. But we'll we'll see. If I if I can make it work, I might make it work. Wait, um, are the, is that available for pre order yet? Can I send people a link? Okay. Yep, yep. You can pre order it at any bookstore around. You know, find your favorite bookstore and say, I want to order side quest a visual history of tabletop role-playing games oh a visual history of role-playing games by... it looks awesome i was seeing on your instagram i did not realize there was so much that goes back so far in history oh yeah oh That's yeah amazing yeah you'll learn a lot for sure so yeah follow me on instagram uh hopefully pick up the book and Maybe I'll see you at Slice, October 26th at the Sheldon. It's a free event. Anyone is welcome to come. There'll be over 100 different vendors, uh, writers, poets, photographers, comic artists, uh, illustrators, all sorts of good stuff. So uh, Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely be applying. I'm, I just need to make sure I actually am free that day, and then I'm yeah. definitely going to try to get on board. Uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely and need even to get if more you, active. You know, don't end up applying, at least come to the show and take a look and see how you like it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, if, if I'm free, I'm going to try to be on the back end. Uh, I, I have so much stuff that I am prepared for shows that I yeah. just haven't been able to have the time to actually go to them. I got yeah. all my books, all my signs, every everything. Yeah. So I'm just like, this will be the one that I'm like, I You're need prepared. one in October. <laughs> Fill it out. Fill it out. All right. Thanks a lot, Steens. Right. Yeah, you're We'll keep welcome. in touch. I'll have you on again uh, um, yeah. in the future. Yeah, yeah. And uh, definitely uh, put your, your friend in contact with me who's doing I'm In. Oh, yeah. I d I'll, I'll send you. Yeah, after I hit stop record, we'll, we'll explain.